was a latchkey kid, so both my parents worked, and I had to come home and make dinner for myself sometimes and pick up my sister. And, you know, I had a job when I was 12, so, I mean, I always had money in my pocket or I stole shit. And <laughs> when I didn't have money, I stole shit. And I used to be a really good thief when I was a kid. So sometimes, sometimes I go in the store. Sometimes when he had money, still stole shit. Just went like that, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not, listen, don't do that. I'm so ignorant, I won't do Tutorials. anything. Tutorials. But I, but, I learned, but I learned the hard way not to steal. And I always tell people, I learned not to steal, not by going to prison, but I was already in prison. And there was a nigga named Francis there. And uh, he was a real diesel ass dude, like a real diesel little fucker, but he was a drug addict. And you know what I mean? He was a cokehead and, and he used to smoke crack sometimes. And he was honest. He was like, yo, you know, I'm trying to get my life back together. He said he just had a baby girl. And I never forget Francis got paroled. So all of us in the weight room, we was all happy for this nigga because we were like, oh, he's going home. You know, he's clean. He's been clean for six months. He's a short timer. They, they shipped him from somewhere else. He's going to be fine. Francis spent all of two weeks free. And this dumbass motherfucker comes getting hauled in, looking skinny as hell, cracked out, fucked up, done lost all the weight he put on in like 20 days. Crazy. I'm like, yo, what is he here for? Francis came back for a $12 pair of gloves. So he was doing right, doing fine, and because of his kleptomaniac bullshit, he was just sitting in Walmart buying groceries with his girlfriend, with the baby, and he decided to shove a pair of gloves in his pocket. And that cost him another year of his life away from his childhood. And I always thought about that $12 pair of gloves whenever I was about to jump the turnstile or whenever I was on parole doing some stupid shit. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I haven't stolen a goddamn thing since then. <laughs> I, mean, I can't, I can't. I mean, I don't owe anybody money right now. Nobody can look at this camera. Matter of fact, a lot of y'all niggas owe me money out there. And when I got out of prison, my entire life was in a bag. Whatever comics I had, whatever fucking sneakers, everything, gone. Everything, every fucking thing that I owned was in a garbage bag that I took out of prison. That my mom made me burn all that shit anyway. So, yeah. I had real monsters to deal with out there. And the, the reality is that, sure, I definitely was like pretty fucked up to some people in high school, but I used to fight a lot of people from outside high school because we went to Hunter, and people thought that everybody in Hunter was soft. So I was like, no, no, this little fish bowl has a few piranhas in it, and I'm going to show you how nasty it can be because I'm going to pull all my friends from uptown, and I'll invite them to hang out here. So when you show up, it's not just the people from Hunter. Now you've got the Bloods from 106, right? Now you've got people from the Carver houses. So it's just a collective, a motley crew of people, and we would always get into drama, you know? But I think that... As it progressed, things got much worse for me, you know, like I, because I caught beef with really nasty people, so I used to carry a gun and a knife with me, and, you know, I'm not proud to say, yeah, I, did you ever have to bring a gun to school? Yeah, I didn't keep it in school, but it was definitely close by, and when I needed that shit, I had it, and it was fucked up, I didn't, I, I, I think back to that, that era of my life, and I, I, I really wish I could talk to myself, but I, I believe then a version of what I believe now, obviously with a much more mature approach, but I always believed that it was better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. So I was like, look, I had a teacher come up to me one time and he said, you know, Felipe, do you really have a, a gun in school? And I told him without getting into too much detail, not for nothing, but somebody tried to stab me the other day. And then I went, we were going to do this shit in the park near a place uh, called The Circle. Somebody took a shot at me there. So I'm like, yo, what do you what do you want me to do? That's pretend that shit didn't happen? Shoot. You want me to pretend that that shit didn't happen? You want me to just get along like it's gonna be cool? You want me to run to the police to help me? Right, the same police that came to my school and told me, hey, you should report it when drug dealers deal drugs. Okay, well, what happens when I, I see the cops beat up the drug dealers and take their drugs, but they don't arrest them? And that nigga got real quiet and moved on to the next question because that's exactly how hard it was. What you want me to go to these extortionists? No, I'm gonna take care of my own goddamn problems. And looking back, I wish I had made other decisions in life because I feel like that violence led me down a wrong path. I started to think that that was what made me powerful. That didn't make me powerful. This made me powerful, you know what I mean? And this is what has me powerful now, not this.
Actually, yeah, you know, I, I love comic books. He he had he originally had a bigger comic book collection than me. Yo, and just, I was like, and, uh, and, and, just retell quickly the story of your the demise of your comic book. This is so heck? sad, bro. Oh no, so yeah. <laughs> don't, don't make him tell so, that story. It's terrible. I love my mom. Treasure Hi, mom. And to this day, she disputes this. When I was a teenager, my mother was, uh, she, was she had a hard time dealing with me at times, you know, just running around the streets with this guy. And, um, but I used to spend all the money I, I've got, you know, I'd spend a little bit of money on lunch every day. You know, I get like a, a bagel with butter and like a coffee or like a Sprite or something. And I would save the rest of my money because on Fridays, new comics got released. And when new comics got released, I went to Action Comics or Uptown Comics on 90, what was that? That was 93rd Street, 93rd and Broadway. And me and this dude used to go to the pizza shop and try to run dudes on Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter and then go to the comic store. I had a hefty collection. You know, think about this. Every week I'm spending 15 of my 20, 10 to 15 of my $25 on $1.50 comics. I got to a point where I had so many comics that I didn't have a place to store them, so I took all of my clothes out of my dresser and was storing them beside my bed and instead put my prized possessions, my comic books, in this six drawer dresser. My mother and I got into an argument and I came home and my comics were all gone. My mother had thrown them out and she said I told her she could do that. This is, this, is, this is pain I carry with me to this day, many years, but shout out to my mom for all the other lessons. <laughs> I have become a producer because my mother gave me piano lessons, so I guess those things offset each other. This but, is like uh, watch, bro. <laughs> yeah, I'm hurting. I still have I'm something. To, right. I'm, I'm still, yeah. Not, it hurts. Maybe he's on no, his fetal sad, position no, no, listening to this. Again. <laughs> it's sad because it reminded me of a fucked up story. I came home from tour one time, and we had been on a, like a mini tour. We had done like probably 15 cities. And I had some cash in a, in a bag. And it was about $35,000. Some uh, cash. I That's left it in a bag. Some change. And uh, I had a bunch of bags in my room. And uh, they were all plastic bags, pla black, white plastic bags tied up. And, you know, like garbage. I went to Boston. And I had my own apartment, whatever. And my dad and my mom... They, they, they said, we're going to check on your apartment, give me your keys. So I gave my keys. They came to check on my apartment. And I came back, and they said, oh, um, everything's clean now. And I said, what do you mean everything's clean? I like everything the way I like it. It's supposed to be there. And they said, Get out of my room, Mom. <laughs> All those bags of garbage that you right. left on the floor in your living room uh, were yeah. thrown out. And I said, what do you mean the bags <laughs> of garbage? Yo, I went to the fucking garbage hub digging through there, digging through the garbage hub. terrible. Listen to me. <laughs> so terrible. Listen, listen to me. And then an angel fell from heaven, and my sister called me, and she goes, hey, stupid, why don't you look under your bed, and why don't you stop doing dumb shit, and you stay out of town. And I went to my room. Shouts to his sister. And I looked she under my shouts. Bed. She's the real MVP. And I wow. looked under my bed, and there was that black bag. Shouts. Out of all the bags, right? My sister knew which black bag. And I said, how'd you know? She said, I picked each one of them up. One of them felt like cigars. One of them felt like there was some weed in there. And one of them felt like there was some money in there. So I decided which one you would probably want the most. And I said, oh, we came out the same room. Oh. <laughs> Shout to my sister. So rewind. <laughs> All of his comics got thrown away. Yeah. And then you they said came back. <laughs> that reminds me of a sad story. <laughs> where I, sad story was I thought I lost thirty five thousand dollars, but then I didn't. My sister gave it back. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, life sucks. It was a sad day. It was a sad <laughs> afternoon. And then she called me and then made me happy. Black Panther, I went and saw it the second day it was out. In uh you know the theater full of rowdy black people, rowdy, proud, excited black folks in Brooklyn. It was fantastic, it was a perfect experience. You know, everyone was standing up cheering. Like, it was wonderful. Like, it was, it, there was really this feeling of community and pride and happiness and, and belonging and just, just this wonderful feeling that, you know, we don't get collectively often at all. Were people um, dressed up? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, without a doubt. You know, everyone, everyone was in there. You know, they kicked their cloth and and like, you know, some people were like Malian garb, some Ghanaian garb. Like it was crazy. It was, it was really crazy. That was fantastic. Um, Infinity War. I actually got a, a friend hooked us up with some like Marvel exclusive tickets. So we went to the spot in Brooklyn, and we uh, it was it was dope as fuck. We, you know, they brought us drinks. We watched the people, you know, people were crying in the theater. Everyone was cheering together. Same same type of situation, but it was like a, a pan cultural geek geek out. It was, it was wonderful. Everything, both of those movies lived up to my expectation. I'm from Harlem, and I think that's been made abundantly clear during this entire interview. But one interesting thing I tell people about Harlem is that the Magic Johnson theaters that are on 125th used to be the place yeah. to watch sci-fi movies until Black Panther came out. Because mind you, I'm not saying black and brown people don't like sci-fi movies. It's just that it doesn't matter what it is. It wasn't a packed theater like that. So when, you know, The Last Jedi came out or yeah. fucking Phantom Menace, motherfuckers would go there and watch it and you would get in easy you would not it would not even be a full theater it could be the opening night of star wars it would be like 10 people in there you could get the fucking shit you wanted to get Beyond. not with black panther i showed up there for black panther they had fucking 20 showings in one day and they were all sold out and mind you these were not it was interesting because i live in a part of harlem that now is subsectioned off on 116th there's a section of 116th that's for like West African people. And there's a lot of Muslims there. Um, and then you have the other side of 116, which is like Central American, right. you know, Salvadorian, Ecuadorian, Mexican. I've lived on both sides. Right. He lived on both sides. <laughs> so all the people of Harlem came there, but they didn't, I mean, like I was asking them if they got dressed up. These niggas came in like they regular clothes, but super, like their so, best, yeah. best, best African gear they could get. The, I seen a motherfucker in there with the King Joffrey Jock fucking thing <laughs> like this with, with the lion. Like, I said, yo! <laughs> motherfuckers is going crazy in there. And mind, you, at his feet as he was. mind you, this was yeah. the only theater where before the movie, I heard a nigga jump up and say, yo, man, for real, for real, can y'all niggas shut the fuck up so I can hear this shit, man? Can y'all niggas please? Please, man. And niggas was like, oh, come on, man. It's nah. a celebration. We wilding out in here, but it was good. It was nice. It was, it was, it was cool. I guess representation matters to a big degree. Yeah. Uh, I think the next step to representation is going into the details of the movie. You know what I mean? You have to ask yourself certain things. If he was so angry about non-interventionalism in the 60s and 70s, then God damn it, he must have really been mad at the king of Wakanda who was alive during the Middle Passage or during the Arab slave trade because that vibranium brought their civilization according to whatever up until what, like 500 AD or something like that was when it dropped. So yeah. You went through some really dark periods in Africa, and this motherfucker was willing to go against his brother over the 70s and 80s? Right. Okay, man. Well, you know, it should have given you some perspective about everything else. But I thought there were a lot of things in the movie that did did kind of give away the characteristics of, of people. Like, for example, Killmonger may have had a good reason for doing some of the things that he did, but remember, uh, the Black Panther was heroic because of his treatment of black woman and Killmonger was the bad guy who deserved to die because he was willing to kill his black woman to get revenge he was willing to sacrifice his queen and it wasn't even the game so that's why Killmonger was a grimy greasy person but it's interesting because you know you really do see him and his abandonment and then turning into wickedness it definitely does underlie a lot of things about how evil isn't just born, it's created in people, you know? And being a person that, that worked in a prison and taught in a prison, that's one thing I realized too, that all those kids that are in prison, the so-called super predators, like the, the scary people, these are children who have been the victims of abuse, like horrible abuse. Like, like, you know, we've had difficult times with our parents, all of us. Nobody's parents sold them here for a bag of cocaine, you know? Nobody's parents, beat them until they were like lost teeth. You know, that, that makes somebody violent. That makes them not trust people. I learned that hard truth about our people. That the vast majority of the people in there are victims of sexual assault, victims of sexual abuse, psychological torture, emotional abuse. And 
the big abuse that isn't talked about, which is abandonment. So it gives us a lot of humility about kind of what I've seen and, and, and putting it into the context of, of how I came about and, and, and the troubles that I experienced as a kid. So, you know, I, I love the idea that we can talk about the fantasy world and all this stuff could be available to us because it does open up new ideas and new realities. But I think besides representation, what's also important is, you know, who's really benefiting off the movie? You know what I mean? Is it going to create something for our communities? And also, the CIA is not the good guy. So, <laughs> right. <laughs>